excited tonight to dive into a topic called Five Things We Love About Men. And the reason Wendy and I chose this topic is because we were kind of conversing and saying, you know what, there's been a lot of negativity out there in the world in the last while around a, a variety of different things. And for even before all of the pandemic and everything like that, a lot of women kind of man bashing or having a negative attitude about men. And in no way are we saying that men are perfect, they're human, they're all individuals just like we are. And in no way do we excuse bad behavior from men or blame women for men's bad behavior. That's not what we're about. We just thought it would be fun though tonight to focus on a few positive things that we have observed and noticed and appreciated about men in general and just share some of those things with you. Because we want to keep tonight kind of upbeat and positive uh, I think we can all use a little bit of that in our lives right now. So with that, um, welcome once again, everyone. We're going to jump in and we're going to talk about five things we love about men. And Wendy, I'm going to let you lead us off with the first one. Yay. Thank you so much for letting me be here. I'm very excited to talk about men. I love men. They're, it's one of my favorite topics. And I really want to get started with one of the things that I love about men that it's because they're compelled, they're, they're motivated to, they just can't help it. They pay a lot of attention to, are we happy? And for some women hearing this for the first time, it might sound really weird because it doesn't always feel like that, right? But if you just walk around the world as an observer, you'll see it everywhere. You'll hear it in their speaking. Men use the word happy. When they walk out, they say things like, I, I think you need to be with someone who can make you happy. <laughs> and I just want to share a couple of stories. One is an antidote that you can take with you to look around the world and see if you can see what we're talking about. And that is, um, I watch, I love Home and Garden, the the channel Home and Garden Television. And there's a million different shows, all the fixer, flipper, house buying, boat buying, all the things, right? So you can go on vacation anywhere and watch any house show where they're gonna show a couple, three houses, whether it's on an island or a beach or the suburbs or whatever, right? And they're gonna pick the house at the end of the three. Like, obviously that's not real life because you have to see a lot of houses, but you will notice if you watch any of these shows at any time that at the very end when they pick the house they'll turn if it's a if it's a heterosexual couple they'll turn to the couple and say why did you pick this house and when the men when the man speaks he'll say something like well you know we had to check the budget blah 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 budget it's like can i can i provide it right so provide comes first before happy <laughs> looked at the budget we figured out this is right for our budget and it makes her happy over and over and over and over. You'll see it everywhere. Like nine times out of 10, they're, they're going to say, and because it'll make her happy. You know, mom is happy. Everybody's happy. It's a saying in our culture. And I hear it everywhere I go. And back when I was on 121 first dates dating, I went out with a guy who was a really great guy, a complete mismatch for me since I don't have any children and he had six of them. But we, we sat down to the drinks and appetizers for our first date. And right out the gate, I'm like, hi, how you doing? I'm Wendy. What's going on? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat newly divorced. So what happened with my life was I met this really amazing woman and all I ever wanted to do was make her happy. And she seemed kind of unhappy, almost on principle, but I, I loved her and I wanted to make her happy. And so she said, if you marry me, I'll be happy. So I married her, but she wasn't happy. And then she said, I'll be happy if we have children. And then we had children six of them. And with each one, she said she'd be happy if we had another one. But then six children later, I could never make her happy. And so at the end of the day, I had to go because she wasn't happy. And all I wanted to do was make her happy. <laughs> it's like he must have said the word happy about 50 times in the first 15 minutes of our date. Maybe so at the, Maybe at the end, she said, if we get divorced, I'll be happy. <laughs> exactly. So I'm sharing that with you because it's really, really, really out there in the culture. And it's something that most often doesn't hit our radar. 
because one, we don't think they'll give it to us. They don't, we, we often can think, oh, well, he's not going to, he doesn't want to make me happy or I'm not enough for him. To, whatever stories we're telling ourselves about not being enough or good enough. Or, right. We, we do that sometimes. So it might be like a, an unwillingness to receive that, but oh my gosh, Michelle, the gift of letting a man make you happy. Talk to us about that because it's phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. When you can receive a man's happiness. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the stories that you shared, Wendy, because those are really good examples and a couple of things that came to mind. So, you know, I've been doing these man panels for a number of years and, and I've had the privilege of interviewing a lot of men as a result of doing this and the work that I am privileged to do in the world now. And so even though I work specifically with women, interviewing these men and having these conversations both on camera and off has been so enlightening and so profound for me and really has helped me even in my own relationship in my own marriage. And then, of course, I tap into the wisdom of my in-house guy here, too. But one of the things that has come through that I just kind of want to add on to what you're saying here, Wendy, is that um, a lot of the men have said, we want to make you happy, but we don't always know what's going to make you happy. So one of the things that they've said to me is, please tell them we're not mind readers. Please let them know that we would like to know what would make them happy. And that can be a very simple request like, you know what I'd really like, or you know what would really make me happy, or you know what would be so much fun for me, or you know what would really help me relax, you know, and then making this request. And then the guy gets the opportunity to do something that makes you happy. He gets to provide something that makes you happy. And then you get the opportunity to appreciate and acknowledge him for that. And this is a point that I really want to drive home here. I don't think most women understand how powerful that appreciation and that acknowledgement can, can be with a man, how much they desire that. Because what often happens with women when we're in a dating relationship or we're in a relationship with a man we almost feel like if a man's giving to us that we need to be giving back in kind or kind of have a quid pro quo kind of thing. But what men have shared with me and what I think we often miss as women is what they long for most is that acknowledgement, that appreciation, that knowing that they have made us happy. And my husband has said, if women understood how much it means to a man just to see that smile on her face, yeah. Just to see her light up, just to see her joy when he provides something for her or does something for her that makes her happy. He said women would be doing a whole lot more of that. So it's kind of a win-win kind of a scenario. We're not being manipulative when we do this. We're letting them know what we'd like, what would make us happy. We're, we're graciously receiving. I like to call it graciously receiving because we're not only open to receiving, but we're appreciative about what we're receiving. We're acknowledging, we're appreciating. And then they get the reward that they need, which is something they long for based on what they've shared with me, far more than you giving back in a quid pro quo kind of way. That is more deeply satisfying for most men than just you doing something, he buys you dinner, you buy them dinner, vice versa. I'm not saying we can't ever do those kind of nice things, but I'm saying I don't think we recognize how powerful that is in terms of a motivator and how much it can inspire men. It yeah, absolutely. And and you were talking about interviewing men, and that's one of the things that you and I have in common that I think a lot of people in our, our industry don't is we have both been ta tasked, tasked with. Originally, it was a task, and then it became a real labor of love and a joy, which is interviewing thousands and thousands of men on what it is to be a man and what works for them. And I just want to add one more thing about that. You're right. It's not a manipulation if you're actually speaking about something that would make you happy or you're declaring, right? And there's a very big difference between using the word that is going to ring in their ears and make them go, Whoop! right? Happy will do that. And I talked about how, you know, men even use the word a lot because they use the word, you might want to use the word too, because you can see there's a really big difference. If I say, oh my God, that'd make me so happy. And then a man hears that and responds versus, you know, I'd really love to blank or um, what I really want is want doesn't 
doesn't translate want. I mean, there's a million things you want. They're not going to act on that, but they will well, act on happy. Yeah, I think happy in their mind, it kind of equates. That's I can make a point there. I can win there. You know, yes. like the old yes. winning, you know, men are winning. <laughs> it's that they can make a point. And just an analogy, which I know I used at least once somewhere in the in the interview series. I can't remember in which interview, but I have given this kind of a basketball analogy. And that's because with my husband and I, we decided, you know, we're never going to be mad at each other based on a holiday or an anniversary or a birthday or Christmas or whatever because we're going to set each other up to win. But this is really more something I have to do than he does because it's pretty easy. He's pretty much happy with anything. But for me, you know, I sometimes have something a little bit in mind about what I'd like to do for the anniversary or what I might like for a gift. And so um, I, I kind of gave this a basketball analogy. I'm not a big sports girl, but I do know enough about basketball to kind of know the positions. So if you think of a, a guard, these are often the people that are like, moving the ball down the court. And a lot of times they're really skilled ball handlers and sometimes they'll hit big three pointers, but more often than not, they'll pass the ball into like the center or the, um, what's the other uh, position? Uh, <laughs> position closer into the basket and then they can make the points. So if you think of yourself as being like the guard and you're dribbling the ball and then you're passing off to the center or the forward, that's the other position I'm thinking of. They, the man represents the center or the forward. They can make the shot. They actually get credit, quote unquote, credit for the for the points. But if you're on the same team, you're both making points, right? And then he gets to win. He's made the shot, but you were the one that like handed it off to him by letting him know what would make you quote unquote happy. And yep. it's a win win. It's a beautiful thing. Agreed. What's number right. two? Number two kind of goes along with number one. Um, it's a, it's very similar, and that's a man's desire to provide. So number one, just to be clear, was their drive to make us happy. Number two is their desire to provide. So this kind of goes along with this. But I want to share a little story here that some of you may have heard me share before too. Before my husband and I met and started dating, he dated this incredible woman. I didn't know well personally. I kind of knew of her through friends of friends and that sort of thing. And she was amazing. I mean, this is the kind of woman that sends out a holiday newsletter. And it's like in January, I opened a school for the blind. In February, I ran a marathon, you know, in March, I did some other fantastic thing. Just reading these letters makes you want to go curl up in a fetal position on the bed and go, I'm exhausted just from reading that, let alone doing it. So very accomplished educationally and professionally and doing a lot of really cool things in the world. And my husband dated her for quite a while um, prior to us meeting. So after things started getting, you know, going really well between my husband and I, I was just kind of curious about what had happened because I'm thinking, well, I think I'm pretty amazing, but I don't send out that kind of newsletter every year for, for the holidays, right? So I, I said to my husband one day, I said, so, you know, I'm just curious what, what happened with you and this, this woman? Because, you know, she's so amazing and I'm, you know, I'm just kind of curious. I felt secure in our relationship and I just kind of wanted to know what had happened. And my husband said something that has stuck with me even now, almost 15 years later. And that was, he said, oh, you're right. She's incredible. She's so amazing. So impressed with her. And I just couldn't get over her, all of her accomplishments and all the amazing, cool things she's doing in the world. And then he said, but I just couldn't really see where I really fit in that picture, where there was really anything I could add to her life or that I could provide for her that would really make a difference. And I remember hearing that and I thought, well, isn't that so interesting? Because I don't know this woman well enough to say, but I, you know, I wonder if that was the intention that she meant to put across. Because I know from my own life, back, with, back when I was in corporate, I was in corporate for many years prior to doing what I do now, uh, I can remember this man that I really liked and was really interested in. And I started sharing with him, you know, some big wins and some big successes that I was having in my career and uh, a big paycheck that went along with it at that time. And I can remember he was impressed with me, but he wasn't falling in love with me. 
<laughs> and that was what I was hoping for. It was like, almost like it created almost like a competitive environment. Like, wow, I don't know if I can keep up with her or I don't know if I can like provide anything for her. It seemed like she's kind of got this covered. I didn't recognize this at the time, but in retrospect, and looking back on that, I think that's the energy that I created with that. So I think the point here is, is that it's not like, for many women, it's not like it was, you know, the housewives of the 50s, for example, where they needed to be married and have someone to support them economically. That may not be the truth for a lot of women now, but men need to see where their presence in your, in your life and what they have to offer can make a difference for you. This is really, really important for them. If you're going to be, if they're going to be the, the man in your life, it's important for them to see that they have something to offer to provide for you. Doesn't necessarily mean always monetarily, but they need to see that there's a place for them to add something to your life. So it kind of goes along with that first one. Wendy, I've been jabbering. You go ahead and pick up from there. Add anything you yeah. want to. Yeah, I'd like to untangle a little something about that because your story, I have heard that story from men over and over and over and over again. And I have heard and seen women, very accomplished women who in my eyes really looked like they had it all and they had everything together. And they, like you said, and why would, why on earth would a man leave the ideal woman? Like, why would you do that? And one thing that we might think is it's because we need to downplay who we are. We can't be big in the world. We're too much. That is not what we're talking about at all. So I'm going to distinguish something for you so you can know when you're out there in the world, you can be as big and as badass as you want to be <laughs> in all the ways that make you amazing and, and huge in the world, right? And at work and all the places. But let me just distinguish something. So. I want you to imagine that you have a best friend, okay? Your very best girlfriend, you've had your best girlfriend for 10 years, she's your ride or die, you love her, she loves you, everything is great. And one day you get blindsided and you're dumped and you're 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 in the dumps and you're sobbing and you're you just don't even know what to do with yourself. All of a sudden, all these emotions are there. And it just so happens, you know, through ESP, she can feel it. So she calls you on the phone and she said, hey, what's up? And you're like, ah, ah, ah. and then you tell her about how you just got broken up with. And then she says, oh, my God, honey, I'll be right there. And you say, no, it's OK. I got this. What if you never let your bestie comfort you and love on you? What if your bestie did that to you? What if it was her heart that got broken and you called and you wanted to fly over there and be there and provide for her and comfort her and love her and support her? And she was like, nope, I'm good. I, I, I know you're hearing me cry, but I'm, I'm okay. I got it all. I got everything handled. So there's this distinction about not letting people in. So receiving is what we let in boundaries or we don't let in. And when we have the whole world handled, there's this big boundary around us of I've got it all handled and taken care of, and no one can provide anything for me. Mm -hmm. And as a human, we have to provide things for the people we love and care about. We have to. And if we can't, we, we'll go away. So if he can't see where he can provide and win and have you lean on him for particular things, what can he possibly contribute? And he, a man has to contribute. He just, at like a knee-jerk response, he has to contribute. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Yeah, that's really beautiful, Wendy. And it reminds me of a Brene Brown quote. I'm a big fan of Brene Brown and her work. And one of the things she said is, you know, we hear this thing, men are intimidated by successful women. And her quote is something like, I, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but men are not so much intimidated by successful women as they are put off by invulnerable women. And what you're describing here is someone who's like saying, nope, got it handled, got it covered. I don't need anybody, don't need anything. And if we're giving off that energy or that message, men are going to believe us. Yeah. And I don't think that it's great to be needy and either do men. Men don't right. look to partner, although we have that whole, oh, he just wants a damsel in distress. No, he doesn't. 
a, a good solid man is going to look for someone who can partner well, where the two of you can elevate together, right? So a smart man is going to look for a team player who can support him and she, he can support her. And so it's not like he's looking for a damsel. And when we're determined to be independent, that that's part of it, that I'm independent. I'm a strong, independent woman. Well, independent is the opposite of partnership. It's like, do you want partnership or do you want independence? Because you need to partner when you're independent. There's just one. So it's it's that thing. It's the I don't need you for anything thing mm -hmm. that gets mm -hmm. in the way. And, yeah. and we do it for a good reason. We do it because we want to show how self-sufficient we are and how amazing we are. And we don't do it to put them off. We do it to showcase our amazingness. Well, and for, for many women, you know, myself included, because I was single until I was 43, it's out of necessity or out of, you know, choice. We, we have to kind of support ourselves. We, we develop a certain amount of pride in successfully doing that. And that's all, that's all fine and wonderful. And, a, but as you're saying, a relationship is a healthy interdependence. It's yeah. not two independent people going their own way. That's not partnership. It's a healthy interdependence. And if you need an example, a really great example in the world is Oprah. Oprah does not need Stedman to put a roof over her head. Probably not. <laughs> but I'm sure she tells Stedman what she needs from him. He, he, she can depend on him for things. He can provide lots of things like listening and comfort and back rubs and, oh, poor baby, that was horrible that what you just went through and all the things that Stedman does that we don't even know about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, Wendy, I'm going to let you um, take number three, because I love what you share about this one. I, I really resonate with this when you've shared this before. So, yeah. And again, we want to just remind you the caveat that we gave in the beginning of, you know, not not all men are amazing. Not all women are amazing all the time. We're not we're not talking about we're not talking about the opposite of what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> but my favorite one of my very very favorite if not my very favorite thing about men is how protective they are how they have a protector button that we can activate and it's actually we don't even have we can't activate it we can push on that button sometimes but also it's already it's already pushed it's already activated you know i run science experiments in the world all the time to look for ways that I and other women are being protected and, they, and mostly the women don't even know it. A uh, very common thing that you'll experience is you might be walking or jogging on a trail, a guy's running up behind you, he'll probably holler out, coming up from the side. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm not a predator, I'm here to, I'm just passing by, I'm just a dude, I'm not here to harm you. I, I got my eye on you, I'm actually gonna protect you. And there's something that a lot of women don't know which is men spend a good deal of their entire life after puberty trying not to be creepy or perceived as lecherous, but they're still protecting you. So you're at the gas station, the dude who's gonna wash your windows when you don't want him to wash your windows <laughs> comes up and starts doing the gas station hustle. There's a guy, at least one, probably more, um, unless they kind of check and see who's who's got her oh you got her okay late late right <laughs> so uh, there's at least one guy who's looking at the situation that you're dealing with through his rear view mirror as he's done pumping gas he's looking forward because he doesn't want to turn around and look at you and cause a spectacle he doesn't want you to have to get your back up even more like oh, oh, i got this i don't need some man coming to my rescue <laughs> So he's watching you forward in the window of his car, making sure till that guy walks away and you get in your car and you drive away and then he'll go on his business. I know this happens all the time. My husband does this all the time and he's a guy. He's, he's a great guy. He's not an exception in this, in this specific way. This is who men are. They, will say they'll alert 
themselves to your presence. I was walking along a street real late one night and there were two guys hanging out in a store front window area. And it was just, they were just loitering. They're just hanging out on the street, but I didn't see them. They saw me first. And in a very low tone, looking down on the ground so they wouldn't be threatening, said, good evening, ma'am, loud enough so I could hear they were there and it wouldn't trip me when I walked by them. So they'll do things to alert you that they're there so you're not afraid. And they will pay a lot of attention to, are you okay? Can I give you one more quick story? Absolutely, we love the stories. So I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and I was driving in downtown San Francisco in a neighborhood that if anything's going on, it's not a neighborhood you want to get caught in. There's, it's not, the streets are real tiny. There are every street's a stop sign, four-way stop signs. You can't get out of there. If something bad happens, like you're just screwed. So <laughs> I'm in my car, happen to be downtown San Francisco in a neighborhood you don't want to be stuck in when something happens. And San Francisco won the Super Bowl. Mm. And everyone had already been in the bars. They all came out, all the woohooing, all the kids, all the 20 year olds were in the streets. The cars in front of me were getting jumped on by the drunk people. And <laughs> I know that when I walk through the world, I get to witness how safe I am. And when I need a moment like this, I look for the opportunity to be saved. I look for my hero in the crowd. And I, I was like, I was sitting there and, and I'm the next car back and I'm about to get jumped on and it's all packed in all the directions. And I can't move and the streets are full of people and bikes and all the things and I'm freaking out. And I take a deep breath and I look over and I see him. He's standing right by my passenger door, staring at me, beaming, waiting for the opportunity to be my hero. <laughs> Step in and we eye to eye it. And I went, oh, <laughs> like, really me? And he, but he was like, yep, did it to the head nod, right? The kid head nod. And he was like six foot four and he, 20 something 21 I'm guessing walked out like moved people out of my way like stopped traffic stopped pushed people back moved me along had me turn so I could get off the main drag of where I was to get through the mob mm. oftentimes we bunny it out we we oh we're, we're freaked out pray look down no no this is your time to look up look around and see where's my hero right now where is he? Because they're often there. They're often waiting. And I've been in some real dangerous situations that we don't have time to share. And some are real personal that I was absolutely saved. So if anyone's ever on a date and it's going real sideways, hot tip, go to the restroom, excuse yourself. And on the way, you can grab a staff person. But I know, I know more than one woman who's grabbed a patron and said to him, hey, buddy, can you help me out? My date, he's getting kind of drunk and handsy and this is not going well. Can you help me get out of this? And absolutely, every time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can remember um, once, so back when I was single, I had a couple of girlfriends that I used to take European vacations with frequently, like once a year, we, we would plan a girl's trip and once I flew over and I was there a couple of days before my girlfriend arrived, my one girlfriend arrived. And so I'm walking along the streets of Rome and this guy is like kind of like following me and bugging me and and kind of harassing me. And, you know, I don't know, like somehow I could just tell as I was coming up, this has gone on for a few blocks and I was starting to feel really uncomfortable and hadn't seen a good place to duck into and so I'm walking along and I see this guy and, you know, I kind of made it obvious that I wanted to get rid of this other guy. And this other guy came up and, and just basically, I don't even know what he said because he's speaking in Italian, but he basically told this other guy to beat it. Like I could like, I like, I signaled this guy, like I'm in a little bit of trouble here and I need a little bit of help. Now, um, before we leave this one, so that's a perfect example of how, you know, someone you can you can sometimes even call on a stranger to kind of help you out of these situations. Like you gave the example in the 
in the bar or in a restaurant or whatever if a date's getting out of hand. Um, but we did have one question come in that I think we want to address right now, Wendy, which was, um, I think it was from Beth, and she kind of said, how do you recognize, this is something you and I have talked about before, how do you kind of recognize or distinguish between someone who might be safe to reach out to or someone who's a predator? Yeah, I mean, it's really tricky, right? Because there's the protector button and then there's the predator button. And not everybody is going to be a jerky guy or going to be predatory with you. And I, I got that question a lot, when, especially when I was dating. How do you handle your safety? And the truth is, is I, I love and trust men. And I for as much as I can trust a stranger for anything, right? I can trust them for, with everything, but I trust that I can have a general conversation in a public place. And so I basically used to tell women, you're going to have to like Google, Google Dr. Phil's top 10 tips on safety. I don't know. Cause I personally went on dates all the time that I would go anywhere public. If there was a public place day or night, I would go there. And I just always made sure that I didn't park my car in a way that I would be trapped if he tried to walk me to my car. And then it was like a, you know, dark parking lot or something. But short of that, I didn't worry about my safety because I knew I was with a stranger that was probably a pretty great guy. And if he wasn't, I was in a public place. So I'd be able to look around and grab somebody. The one time I did something really dumb, luckily I caught it in the moment and he was a great guy. He wasn't I mean, he wasn't a great guy, but he was <laughs> he wasn't behaving badly in any way on the date. But um, I lived in a very small town called Mill Valley, which is right outside of San Francisco. And it's a very woodsy town. And Mount Tam is there. So what people in Mill Valley do is they hike. Like, that's what you do there. You hike Mount Tam. That's all you do there. It's all there is to do there. <laughs> and so when someone says, hey, do you want to go for a hike? Well, yeah, because that's what you do there. Right. It's like if you live by the ocean, you go swimming. If you live near Mount Tam, you go hiking. So I said yes to hiking. Don't say yes to hiking. <laughs> Especially when you don't know somebody. Not a first date. You don't, so want, to go into, you don't want to go into a remote wooded area no. with someone you don't know. No. I said yes to him and I said, let's meet downtown at the coffee shop and then we'll go go up Mount Tam. Go go right into the wilderness together. And as I was walking toward him, my gut said, nope. And I had literally three seconds and before I was right face to face with him. And I said, hey, um, I'm glad we're here. And I've noticed that my shoe, I think the glue on the sole is coming up from the bottom. So I don't think hiking is a great idea. Let's just go walk the urban neighborhoods and go look like we can walk up the hill and look at where the rich people live and you know, walk around like that. But let's keep it local. Let's keep it right into town here. And yeah, he told me stories that made me not want to ever go on a date with him. And I was really glad that I was not on a mountain. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think our, I don't think our, our mission here or what we can accomplish here today is to guide someone how to protect themselves from any kind of random crime. But I think what we are talking about here is first of all, you can do a lot for yourself when it comes to dating by setting things up so that you are in a public area where you are not meeting someone for hiking or in a remote place or in some place that you're not familiar with. Um, like when you're getting to know someone, like you set things up in a way that you feel comfortable, where you're gonna feel safe, where you know the surroundings. This is why I'm, and I said this again on one of the interviews, this is why I'm a big fan of, for at least for the first date or two, you don't go to some halfway point, you know, three hours away to meet some guy where you're in unfamiliar surroundings. If he wants to meet you, he comes to where you are so that you can be in more familiar surroundings. And so you can set it up so that you feel comfortable and you feel safe and you can arrange to be in a place that if you need to get out of there, you have an opportunity to get out of there. Also, I think what we're talking about is that there are many men, and I believe most men out in the in the world that do have this more protective nature who would want to help a woman if there was a need for that kind of thing. We're not saying trust every random stranger. And I also believe, you know, there's a book that's called The Gift of Fear. And 
I don't like us to be driven by our our irrational fears, but I think that we have a God-given gift, if you want to call it that, or an instinct or a woman's intuition. And if something feels off, if something feels wrong, if something you can't even quite identify, if something feels really uncomfortable to you, it's really important not to ignore that and get yourself out of whatever situation is causing that or away from that kind of person that is causing that. I just think that's really, really important because I, over the years, I've talked to so many women that have gotten into one kind of situation or another that has not gone well. And, you know, some of them have ended up being in abusive relationships or other things. And, and in almost every case, I'll say, look, I understand hindsight is twenty twenty, but looking back on it now, were there any warning signs, signals, uncomfortable feelings, you know, something felt off, something just kind of, you know, made you wonder, was there anything like that going on that could have indicated that things could move in this direction? And in almost 100% of the cases, they say yes, but for whatever reason, they liked him or there was chemistry or they chose to like, just kind of ignore that. Um, and it ended up not going so well. So we also have to trust that inner guide, those instincts, and, and that gift of fear when fear is really based in something that we have reason to be afraid about. Well, I want to share something that is really common, and this is a woman thing. This isn't a low self-esteem thing. This isn't a defective thing. This is a woman thing. Our instincts will do one thing, but then our instincts will kick in again and make us do something else. So great example, I see him, my gut says no, right? Mm -hmm. That's instinct, no. Now what would have normally happened, see I had a moment of total human spirit victory breakthrough by say making up a lie, right? <laughs> what normally would happen is something like, oh, just go along to get along, don't be judgy, it'll, it'll all work out. So you're in a hotel, you're, you're at a hotel for work, right? You're out of town, you're, you're working. The hotel elevator opens up, your gut, the hair on the back of your neck or on your arms it's perk up when you see who's in the elevator. <gasps> instinct, right? That's the, gift of other fear. Instinct, that's, huh? the gift, that's the gift of fear, what you're describing right there. That is. Yes, and then, then we have the voice get in because otherwise don't, don't let him think you're judgy. You're not judgy. You're not judging him. Don't let him see you're judgy. So that inner critic will try and override your other instincts. So instincts is the gift of fear. And then second kick in the other instincts saying, don't be judgy. Girl, be judgy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or yeah better or to, whatever to, to go along. Yeah, better to trust that. Sorry, Wendy. Yeah. Better to go along than get along. Yeah. Better than going along to get along. My yeah. friend Shadi had a really good. Yeah. Um, my my friend Shadi had a really good fourth thing. You know, the fear is flee, freeze, and fight. The instincts, the our our fear instincts, free fear is fight, flee, or 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 freeze. My friend Shadi said, "No, there's a fourth one. Follow." You don't know what to do. You're freaked out. Just follow along. It'll hopefully it'll all turn out. Mm -hmm. Instinct. Yeah. And what you're describing, I've sometimes, you know, where you have that initial reaction, that initial instinct, that in initial message where something feels off or something feels uncomfortable. I sometimes call that we sometimes try to overthink or outsmart our intuition. And that's that second piece that you're talking about. And that happens so often with women. I do think that is a pattern that so many women have. And that's why sometimes we can end up in situations that we didn't intend to get ourselves into. So setting things up in a way where you're really taking care of yourself right from the start is a big way to avoid these kind of situations and recognizing that there are many men out there. I believe most men out there who have that protective nature while still acknowledging and recognizing there are some predatory kind of men out there as well. And we have to be careful with those. Yep, exactly.
Well, I'm just going to review so far. Number one is their drive to make us happy. Number two, their desire to provide. provide. Number three is their protective nature. And number four is how much they need us, what we bring that they can't get without us. Ooh, I love this one. So I want to, um, I was asking my husband about this. I just said, you know, I said to him, I said, why do men need women? And um, he was he was talking, just rattling off the top of his head. And I was trying to capture his words. But I want to share this with you because I thought what he says um, I thought what he said was really beautiful and forgive me if I didn't quite get it right, but I'm going to do the best I can to capture his words. He says, a woman connects a man with life, not just in the biological sense, a woman's capacity for social and interpersonal connection pulls a man out of his more linear tasks and thinking his more solitary task oriented mindset. Women are what brings civilization because men will get together with other men, but it's usually more about accomplishing a task or recreation. But if someone gets humanity together for its own benefit, it's usually women. Women get together with other men because there's a purpose to it, because it makes sense. Um, and women understand that human, rela human relationships themselves, for all the potential reasons that people might Get together is beneficial. Women understand that those relationships need to be formed and maintained constantly. Men will get together to watch the game, go hunting, etc. Then they all go home, maybe slap each other on the back, says, see you soon, bro. A man is not likely to send a little gift or call a guy again when he gets home. That kind of relationship always being on the cutting edge of relationship is more in the realm of women. Men see human interaction as useful and having a practical pur purpose. We get together to do X. Men don't usually get together just to get together. One woman can walk up to her neighbor's porch, sit, sit down, porch, sit down, just have a long chat with another woman. Women often thrive in this kind of situation. Human interactions can sometimes be enjoyable, um, can be enjoyable just for their own sake. It can feel forced for a man to just visit just for the sake of visiting. There often needs to be a purpose to it. What women do is they help a man develop a man. They help a man develop a new dimension of himself that joins with the flow of life around them for purpose other than just carrying out concrete tasks in cooperation with others. I just thought that was really kind of beautiful the way that he said that. And then he said, um, Harvard University did a study where they studied thousands of students and found there was a direct correlation between happiness and the close relationships those people maintained. The money, the money angle did not correlate in the same ways. Once you get to a certain point financially, some say it is around 75K and that may depend on where you live, but it says the addition of more money does not necessarily increase in the same way as earnings go up. This connection that a woman can create in a man's life and a safe place for him to share his feelings and emotions can literally increase a man's happiness. If the woman is sensitive in a way that works best with her man's existing personality um, and allows him to respond in a positive way, he can experience deeper satisfaction in written, and richness in all of his life experiences. I just thought that was really beautiful the way my husband said that. And I apologize if I didn't read it perfectly, but I thought he had some really great thoughts to share there. Yeah. And I can remember just one more thing on this and I'll let you pick it up, Wendy. Um, I can remember when um, a few years ago when I was doing the man pal panel and I interviewed Evan Mark Katz and he almost got like kind of choked up and he almost got like emotional when he was sharing this. And he's like, if we don't have you, what do we have? He said, I've gone for months, sometimes years without connecting with like the best friends that I have in my life. If we don't have you to share our hopes, our dreams, our emotions, our fears with, what do we have? Who do we turn to? Maybe we have our work. 
but that doesn't mean so much if we don't have anyone to share it with. Maybe we have some success from the outside world, but if we don't have anybody to appreciate or acknowledge or cheer us on or be excited for us, it doesn't mean so much. And he really like got almost teary-eyed when he was sharing it with this. And he said, men are just like you. They have hopes, dreams, fears, disappointments, rejection, hurt relationships that haven't worked out he said but the difference is a lot of times we don't have anyone to talk to about talk to it about or share it with or help us through it or support us through those challenging times and if we don't have you what do we have so I just think those are a couple things I wanted to highlight there they absolutely need us and one of the biggest things they need us for is because we pay attention to them and we are we are the world, we create the world. You know, when I was in my 20s, I married young and I, I hadn't started studying men in my 20s yet it's because of a failed marriage that I started. But in this marriage, this failed marriage, my beloved ex-husband, who's a dear friend of mine today, my beloved ex-husband would come home from hanging out with the guys, right? That I'd say, and I'm friends with the guys. I, I just wasn't with him while he was with the guys because he was with the guys. And as a cute little 20 something year old, I'd say, what'd you do? And he'd say, we hung out. And I'd say, what'd you talk about? And he'd say, nothing. No, no. But really though, what did you talk about? Nothing. For years, I thought he was lying to me. For years, I just thought he was concealing what they talked about. Like, well, didn't <laughs> Didn't CBS talk about the girlies dating or didn't Martin talk about the blah, blah, blah? Nope, nope, nope. Your husband's right. They get together, they do the thing. They watch the game or they see the band or they do whatever they're doing. Uh, they might toast if they're at a pub and talk about something completely mundane, like, I don't know, news, current events, maybe. We're the ones who bring the connection and the attention. And you'll see this in our culture the most when a man loses his wife, whether it whether she passes away or the divorce happens, mostly they're with the next one within a year mm -hmm. because they need us way more than we need them and they know it. Because we have each other. We <laughs> think about how, as a single woman, how connected you are. You're, you feel like you're disconnected. You have your girlfriend come over. She lays on the couch with you. You watch Netflix. She'll hug you. She'll play with your hair. She might even braid it if you ask nice. You pet each other. Like we, we talk, we connect, we touch. Men don't get touched. And that ex husband that I was just talking about, I've been in his life for 30 years and I will always be in his life and I see him at least once a week. And when I do, I am very touchy with him. It makes him all squirmy and uncomfortable because he's just kind of like that anyway. <laughs> but I do it because I know that I'm the only person in the world who connects with him, who touches him, who listens to him in that way. So you might, you might overlook the massive massive gift we are the contribution we are because we are so connected to everyone we talk to they're not and when we have sex with them it's like plugging in <laughs> we are their life source it's like plugging right on into the wall yeah yeah and that's kind of what my husband started with it's not just the biological or the physical we are literally their life source their source of what makes life richer and fuller and like you said like if, she, if a woman goes on a date you know you think about this scenario if I go on a date and I'm like I'm calling Wendy my friend and I'm like Wendy I went on the best date oh my gosh Wendy's gonna be calling me back and like she's gonna be like details girl tell me the details right I want to know everything from beginning to end we can share like that with each other and my husband said, if if I go on a date back when I was single, if I went on a date, you know, the conversation would go, yeah, went out to dinner, took so-and-so out to dinner, went pretty well, she's pretty nice. That's the conversation, right? They're not talking about the feelings or the emotions. They're not talking a lot about that typically, right? That's just typically not the kind of ways that they connect. And 
literally as a woman in a man's life, you can be the only safe source he has to share those kind of feelings with his emotions, his dreams, his disappointments, his fears, his victories, his successes. You can be like the only channel that he really has. You know, he might high five his buddy, but he's not going to really be able to share those kind of things typically with another male person, which is coming back to what you said, why so many men, if they lose their wives, they're back in another relationship just like that. In fact, in my area, I had two men lose their wives to cancer and both of them within a year, one of them in way less than a year, were married again. Yeah, and everybody, especially the children, get so upset by this and think, well, why doesn't he honor his wife? Honestly, if he's hooking up immediately after and with the next woman, he is honoring his wife. He is saying, I loved being married. I loved being in partnership. I miss her and I need a woman. All that is. Although I did say when I had cancer and for a while didn't know if I was going to survive, I did tell Benjamin if he did that, that I would come back to haunt him. <laughs> I don't want Dave to wait a single second. I want him right out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do you have anything else you want to add to that one, Wendy? How much they need us? Nope. All right. That's what I got. Then we're going to jump into number five. This is a really lovely thing about men. And Wendy, I'm going to let you lead off on this one too. One of the really delicious things that I love about men is how they accept us. You know, when we start dating, they're checking us out. Like, can I get what I need from her? Is she, I mean, she's super cute, but is this going to work out? And do our lives align and there's all these things that they're having to figure out just like we have all these things that we're trying to figure out right but when we're trying to figure it out we'll make a list of what we love about him and we'll tell our girlfriends and say how well it's going but we'll also start to make a mental note of what needs to change right? <laughs> like he's really mm -hmm. great except for that that thing though the way he dresses i'm gonna have to fix that but luckily that's a fixable one. I can fix that. Okay. Then also, hmm, I don't know that he's ambitious enough. So I'm going to have to ride his ass and get him up into upper management. Can I do that at this stage? Maybe I can give it a try. Right. So we'll start to figure out how we can change him into the one that we want him to be. <laughs> We just do. That's just, it's our nature. It's, that's what we do. They don't do that. They don't do that. They think to do that to somebody would be really rude. <laughs> they, don't. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't do it. They, they assess, they look, they see. And then after weeks, months, or I don't know, a couple of years of courting, however long it takes them to figure it out. When he commits, he commits to the whole package. Like even the parts that he doesn't, you know, necessarily, someone might say, oh my God, she's, she's so, she has such a foul mouth. Yep. That's just Wendy. That's who she is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she swears like a sailor. She laughs too loud. She blah, 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 right. Whatever it is, whatever complaint someone else might have about you, he's not going to have that complaint about you. He's it. Or if he had the complaint, he's not actively working on changing you. And it's one of the greatest things I love about men, because not only when they commit to the whole package, they have a mature relationship to things change as we age. So we might be freaked out that we don't have that hot body we had at 22, but they don't expect that. You know, we're very we're looking at every milli inch and every ounce and pound on the scale. Most men don't do that. I mean, there are those exception guys who are like, could be tighter. Uh, don't date those guys. Uh, we're not talking about those guys. They're, they're rare anyway. They're not as rare, rare as I'd like them to be, but they're rare. But for the most part, men, very, very, very gracious in accepting the whole package and not working on changing who we are. Yeah, you know, my husband uh, was engaged years and years before we met when he was much younger. And he was engaged to this woman. And uh, one day he said, this was kind of the beginning of the end here. 
she came to him and she said, you know, I, I really love you and everything, but I've made a list here of a number of things that are going to need to change in order for things to work between us. I mean, he, she literally gave him a handwritten list of a number of things that she needed him to change in order for the relationship to work. And he's like, I knew that probably wasn't going to work out very well. And there's some kind of, there's some quote, and again, I'm paraphrasing, I apologize for not having it in front of me. I wish I'd have thought of it before, but it basically says, men go into marriage hoping a woman won't change, and women go into marriage hoping a man will change, and both are going to be disappointed. <laughs> and so one of the beautiful qualities about man, men is if they choose you, if it, you know, you choose them back, but if they choose you and choose to be with you, they're going to be accepting of who you are. They've already like kind of a, assessed that this is going to be something that is going to work for them. Yeah. And it's a dangerous game for us to go into a relationship with a man thinking that we're going to change him or wanting to change him because he's going to feel that no matter how subtle or how sweet we think we're being about it, he's going to feel that. And that's going to feel disrespectful to a man. It is. Yeah. It's going to feel disrespectful because a man would would not think of doing that because he would consider that to be disrespectful for to you. Yes. And so a good man who chooses to be with a woman, he's already done that calculation in his mind, which in some cases is why a man sometimes will take longer. He's calculating those kind of things. He's also calculating what responsibilities and what comes along with each level of commitment going from, you know, a casual dating to a more serious dating to a being in more of a partnership or committed relationship, exploring what could really happen, moving into kind of a more committed relationship or being engaged and or married. He's, he's made those calculations. You can guarantee it. If he's dealing with you in good faith, he's, he's made those calculations. Yeah. And many of us Whereas, are like, but we love each other. It's, it's, but it's, it's love though. And they understand very deeply that with every level, there's more commitment, right? There's more accountability. And can I be accountable for more every time we up the game of the escalator of relationships, right? The relationship escalator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to review here, um, we're going to do, we're going to just go over the five because I've had a couple of people say, can you summarize? Number one, their drive to make us happy. These are five things Wendy and I love about men. Their desire to provide, their protective nature, uh, how much they need us, what we bring and how they can't get along without us or they're better off with us. My husband sometimes says, um, I put you on the lifelong quest to civilize me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he sees it. <laughs> um, and number five is their acceptance of the woman they love. And like we said, we're not saying men are perfect. We're not saying there aren't guys out there that are ones you want to avoid. We are just wanting to keep this upbeat and look at some of the positive aspects of men that we've observed and experienced in our opportunities to interact with men, because we think there's really a need for that out there. There's enough man bashing and um, all of that going on in the world. And right now we need, we need more positivity and light in the world. I really feel. So I just really wanted to keep this upbeat. And Wendy and I are going to take some, um, we're going to take some Q and a. Yes. I can't wait. I love Q and a. Let's do oh, it. Me too. Me too. Um, let's see. We'll just kind of move as fast as we can through these so we can take as many as possible. Okay. Um, how to date safely during COVID? That's from Karen Shapiro. Do you want to jump in or you want me to first? Go ahead. Do you jump in first? Well, first of all, I'll try to be quick because we could do a whole class on this. But I will just say I have been working with clients all through the COVID, all through the COVID um, pandemic. And I've had many clients have met and gotten into relationships during COVID. That having been said, of course, safety is always got to be an important concern. Even before COVID, safety was a, an important concern, but this is out in another layer. So some of the things that you can do, again, depending on your situation, your circumstances, and where you're at in the world are perhaps starting with a virtual date, uh, or at least a phone conversation. Um, doing a date outside, walking in you know, a, a place where you feel safe, 
um, dining outside, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, there are ways to connect. And online dating has been the main way to meet people for the clients that I've been working with. You know, frankly, when the pandemic hit, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with all my clients? How am I going to help them? But it's been amazing how resilient and how um, well my clients, so many of my clients have thrived even during the COVID pandemic. Do you have anything you want to add, Wendy? I'm trying to be concise here. Yeah, I just have a don't, which is don't try and rule people out because you had a Zoom conversation. I don't I, think that it's, if you see someone's profile and you like who they are, they, they've got a lot going on in there and they seem interesting to you. It's worth just going and meeting for coffee or walking around a very public park or something where you can stay six feet distance, maybe take your mask off now that we can be outside without a mask and just get to know each other walking around an urban setting or somewhere where there's a lot of people around and you can engage that way. Or like I said, have a, a coffee far apart at what used to be a community table, which is now a table for two, right? <laughs> Clearer than far apart. So definitely do the in-person because, um, you just can't tell with the phone and you can't tell with video. And some people give really good phone and some people know how to talk on video and some people don't. One of my very closest people I didn't uh, the, in my life, I didn't get to see him when the pandemic hit because we were all on lockdown and I wanted to connect with him and we did a Zoom call. Man, that guy cannot do Zoom. I, I couldn't get off, that. I, I really missed him and I had a lot to catch up on with him and I couldn't get him off that Zoom fast enough. Mm -hmm. I said, you and I have to just do phone. I can't, I can't, can't watch you like ADD boy over there with the video. <laughs> so we will prejudge somebody on a first date that we don't know if we're Zooming when if you had met in real life, it probably would have been fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. This one says from Judy, how long do you date and then ask, talk about sex? I'm going to let you take that one first, Wendy. <laughs> you like how I'm I talked about, about I talked about sex in my online profile. <laughs> I talked about it right there on my homepage of match.com and OkCupid and all the other things I did. So it, for me, sex is very important. And I think it's important that you talk about what's important to you. So if what's important to you is church, lead with that. If what's important to you is hiking, lead with that. Because if you will notice, if you read a dating profile and there's limited information, whatever's on there, like if he's talking about golfing, now he's Mr. Golfer. So whatever you put on there, whatever he puts on there is magnified by like a thousand. That's who he is. That's who you are. So if sex is important to you, sooner versus later. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of authenticity. And when I was publishing my book, 121 First Dates, I was going around to the big publishers and the big five in New York um, Simon and Schuster and Random House. I ended up with Simon and Schuster, but Simon and Schuster, Random House, all the big five and many more had the very same question for me over and over and over. What's your gimmick? What's your rule? What's the hook? So what are you talking about? Well, how many dates do they need to wait so it turns into a real relationship? I said, you know, that's bullshit, right? Like, it's not like all men have the number and the number is nine, but they're just not willing to share it with the world. Like when the right time to talk about sex, when the right time to do sex is when you feel like you're ready to have all the conversations you need to have about it, that you like this person enough and trust this person enough and feel safe enough to have all the conversations. And, and then you can go from there. But I don't, I, I told Simon and Schuster, you want a gimmick? You want a gimmick? You want a rule? First date, first date. Yep. You know, I just, I just want to say, um, you know, I think this is a very, very personal, um, personal thing, how you feel about sex in terms of your, you know, spiritual, religious, moral beliefs, whether there are, th there are those there that are a factor for you or not. For me, that was a part of who I am. And yet I still think we don't want to squelch. One thing that I think is really important, we don't want to squelch 
the idea of sexual attraction in a man. Like most women want to be with a man that is sexually attracted to her. And we don't want to set boundaries or standards in a way that like shut that whole thing down or make him feel like that's never, ever a possibility with you. If that's the kind of relationship you want, if you want a romantic relationship that includes sex, I think there are ways to respect what feels right for you in terms of the timing and the, in terms of the conversations that you have while still letting a man know that that's something that you would like to have as a part of a relationship. So when I've talked to John Gray about this a couple of times, he said, you know, if you're feeling this way, it's okay to say, you know, what I know about me is that I feel like it's better for me to get to know someone a little better before I feel really comfortable and before I really feel really safe in, in a sexual kind of relationship. But I want you to know there's a lot of attraction and chemistry for me. And it's something that I really would look forward to when the timing is right. right. He said, just a man hearing that and knowing that it's something that you're interested in, that you would like at some point is, is enough to keep a man um, in the game. So he's not feeling like that aspect of things is just being shut right down or that you're making him bad or wrong for having those kind of natural desires or instincts. I think that's just something to be aware of. While you can still honor yourself and do what you feel is right for you in terms of the timing and the pacing and that kind of thing. Because I do not think the right reason to have sex is because you feel obligated or pressured to do so. Yeah. And there's something else that is indicative of the question, when is the right time to have sex for the first time? So it turns out, you know, there are all these rules. There was the three date rule with the book, the rules. And then in the, in the nineties, I think someone thought that was a little too, too soon. And so they came up with the 30 day rule. And then Steve Harvey came up with a 90 day rule. Yeah. The cookie. <laughs> Right. Is it is it 90 days? Or is it two days? Yeah. It's 90 days. 90 days and the cookie is Steve Harvey's thing. Yeah, but here's the problem with that. If you're not a 90 day woman, but you're gonna follow Steve's cookie guideline of 90 days. Now you're I understand, and Michelle understands, and your girlfriends understand that you're employing Steve's strategy to for the good of the relationship to have it turn out because you're a good woman who wants it to turn out. Right. But how it occurs to a man is you at some point in that 90 days are actually authentically ready perhaps. And you are holding out for some sort of strategy, which makes you by default strategic. And there's no authenticity there, which makes you fake and also manipulative. So here you are trying to be a good woman, trying to make the relationship happen, no malice intended. And he's looking at you like, oh, you're gaming me? Well, game on, I'll wait 90 days, nail you and walk away. It will flip the minute we start strategizing, they'll start strategizing. Mm -hmm. The minute you bring authenticity the way Michelle so beautifully demonstrated, you really walked them through a really beautiful demonstration of authenticity when I'm ready. They can live with that. And the other thing that backfires is when we were like gaming it like that is um, one man once told me, oh, he was really, really, really quality guy. I loved this guy. Um, he was saying, you know, when I was younger, he married, when I talked to him, he was married, um, still married. Um, he said, when I was younger, I met two different women at different times in my life that I thought we're going to be my wife before I met my, my, my lovely wife. Right. And he said, I had to let both of them go for the same reason. They were really putting me through the paces around having sex for the first time. And I got to tell you, if it's that hard to get what I need in the beginning of a relationship, I can only imagine it's going to be harder. And there is no way I'm going to marry a woman who's going to put me through the paces and make me jump through hoops just to get my basic needs met. So it can actually backfire on us when we're not authentic. Well, and I think that is the real key. It's not about manipulation or game playing or some arbitrary rule. It's really being in tune with what is right and good for you and being authentic about sharing that. 
And if you're not ready, that's okay. But you can still share that in a way where a man knows that you're not just rejecting him or shutting that part of him down or making even worse, making him wrong or bad for having those desires. Because for most women, don't you want to be with a man that wants to be with you in that way? I mean, really, that's part of what makes this kind of a relationship separate and distinct from other kinds of relationships. And yeah. so it's, 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 you can be honoring to yourself and be in tune with what is right for you and not have sex to manipulate or to, because you feel pressure or because that you think the guy wants it. And that's what you have to do to get or keep his interest. I don't think those are the right reasons, but you can also be real and authentic and honest about where you're coming from. I like Wendy. I'm like totally into being real and honest. I'm going to, say the truth and let the chips fall where they may because you know that's what that's what i believe a, a relationship is built on is that kind of foundation if we can't be real and honest and authentic with someone we're not going to be forming the foundation of the kind of relationship that really supports intimacy and that's what we really deeply desire in our relationships of this kind i believe okay let's see dion says why do men feel the need to belittle others to make themselves be the top dog in the room do you want to go that first or do you want I, I me to go on that? I got, got nothing. Nothing. Well, I just think, um, I think Alison Armstrong talked a little bit about this. She was describing how um, when she was doing these live man panels in some of her events, like if one of the men like made all the women laugh and suddenly the other men on the, uh, on the man panel in her live sessions were like trying out their comedic chops, so to speak. You know, they're trying to make the women laugh too. Like it like created almost like a game on competitive vibe between the men. Or if someone made all the women go, ah, because he said something so sweet, then the other guys were doing that too. I think men, um, I think it's part of their nature to be competitive, you know, out in the, in the career world, in a lot of aspects of their lives. And from a, um, you know, from a standpoint of like the caveman style, they had to like run faster than the predator or they had to run faster after the game. They had to be the best hunter. I mean, I think part of this is kind of in their DNA. And I think sometimes when it happens on a date, they're either trying to impress you, which is often the case when they're bragging, 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 or they're really nervous. And so they talk, talk, talk about themselves. Don't ask any questions about you. They're thinking they're impressing you. They're doing the opposite. But I think that's at least a little glimpse maybe into that. I'm not yep. saying it's lovely behavior, but I think that's maybe a little bit about what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. Carolyn says, can you give some good tips for online dating? I've been trying it for a long time, but I've not been successful. Again, we could have a whole class on this. But um, we both have a few tips. I'm going to let you go first, Wendy. You, you need to do first? three things. Okay, three things. All you need to do is three things. Get started. Yep, get started. Don't settle. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. Get started. Yeah. Don't settle. Don't stop. Those are really good. I'm going to add a couple of things there um, that are a little bit more um, just basic. Have great pictures. Your pictures are what attract the eye of the man. Uh, men are known to be visual. Your your main headshot or main shot needs to be really good. Hopefully, with you looking in the camera and with a smile, doesn't hurt to look a little friendly. You don't have to be overly sexy or pro provocative, but you want to look warm and friendly. So great pictures, and I like to think of your pictures. You know, they say a picture paints a thousand words. I like to think of your pictures as being kind of a snapshot of your life, so that if someone looks at your pictures. They get a vibe of who you are, even if they don't read your profile. Then I would say, um, recognize the nature of the beast. It's a tool and tools are to be used in a way that they work for you. So online dating is a tool, but in order for a tool to be effective, you got to get the tool out of the toolbox and you got to use it. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I recommend for my clients that you spend a certain amount of time each week. You can determine that amount of time doing some searching and perhaps sending messages. And I like for women to send some of the first messages. You don't have to say, hey, baby, do you want to go out or do you want to meet for a drink? But you can make a comment or a compliment, ask a question. 
and um, then say, um, I hope you have a great night, looking forward to your reply, or I'd welcome your reply. It's like the online version of smiling and making eye contact. You're saying, if you approach, I'm open to a conversation. And just like men sometimes need that kind of signaling in real life where we smile and make eye contact, where we're saying, if you come over here, I'm not going to bite your head off or reject you. This is a way of just creating an opening. So if you recognize it as a tool and you recognize it as something where it's a lot of sorting and sifting, because this is a broad swath of humanity, not all of these people are going to be matches for you, but you start using it as the tool consistently, like Wendy said, get started, keep using it, don't quit, um, then your chances of meeting someone that you might not otherwise ever meet in real life that might be really wonderful for you uh, go up exponentially. And um, the other thing I would just say is if we can lighten things up a little bit, lighten up the energy around it, sometimes, especially when we get a little older, because I work with mainly women in their 40s and above, into their 70s, um, we kind of can get like this heavy energy around dating. Like it's like, oh, I've got to go this online dating again. And all these are duds. And ugh. like, you know, we've all heard this, Wendy and I, we've heard this over and over again. All of their, all the ones out there are just deadbeats or duds. Um, and if we can lighten the energy and just like, just try to make it almost a game, like just have fun. I'm just going to interact with people out there. I'm just going to think of this as just a little dance of, potentially interacting and meeting some new people and, and have a lighter energy where it's more fun and it's a little bit more playful, that is even going to come across in your messaging, in your interactions online. Because when we have this heavy energy around dating, people can feel that. Even if we don't intend for them to feel that, it comes through even in a short little message online. It's so, it's so weird how that comes through so powerfully. So those are a few things. We could do a whole class on this. I just want to say a little something more about that. Um, I want to give you my stats. So 121 first dates, uh, of them 100 plus, I think it was, it's in the book, but I think it's 108 or 118, 108 or 118 were from online dating. From So 100 plus states I, I did online and, from online dating and I reached out to nearly every single one of them and I never asked anybody out ever. Mm -hmm. So dropping that handkerchief saying, hi, out of the 25 million people on here, I see you and you're interesting. You're an interesting person. Doing that is that friendly. If you come back, come over here and get me, then you're not going to be in trouble. Because remember, I talked about earlier how a lot of guys don't want to be perceived as a creepy guy and they can be tentative. So you're giving them the green light by reaching out, but you're not pursuing. So I'm going to rephrase that, actually. If you are the type of woman who hopes he will pursue you then that would be one way to get quality men that you want to date to come pursue you. Now, if you want to be the pursuer, if you want to like make things happen and be the action oriented one, then yeah, go ahead, reach out, ask them out, do all the things, do what works for your own personality. But what we hear over and over and over is I don't want to be the one to have to make the first move. I want him to pursue me. And I just got to tell you, 10 years in the trenches and 121 first dates and thousands and thousands and thousands of prof profiles I read through. If I just sat back and waited for the ones who were coming to me, no friends, it would not have turned out for me. You might only be on date 21 right now. Right. Yeah, I, I would have been on 121 really not that quality date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and most women are more comfortable and want the man to take the initiative. And I actually really support that because I think it works for most women. That's what most women want. But if you think of this really as being like almost like the online version of smiling and making eye contact, you're just inviting conversation. You're not initiating a date or asking him out or asking him for his number. You're literally just giving him that signal. It would be safe to approach. I think that's really powerful because as I've interviewed men, men have said to me, you know, you think it's tough for you out there online, unless you look like Adonis, uh, you know, most women don't re respond to our messages. They experience a lot of rejection out there. So like a friendly online version of the eye contact and smile by sending a, a nice warm message is um, really, really powerful. 
And I will say, though, for most women, you still have to recognize just based on the way these um, sites are set up and how some people may be actively using the site and some may not. This doesn't mean you're going to hear back from every one of them, but this puts you more in the in the situation where you can be a little bit more of the chooser in whom you interact with. And I think that feels good to a lot of women because at least you're starting from a baseline of, you know, this would be someone I'd at least be open to having a conversation with. Well, we're going to, we're going to wrap up. And I'm going to leave you with my biggest tip about men. Can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. My biggest tip about men is when you're in a relationship, if you paid attention to letting him know that you're fine when you're fine, you don't need anything, right? You're good. If you let him know, I'm good right? How's your day? I'm good. (laughs) Or if you're not good, what it is you actually need? Like what's up, right? (laughs) What's going on? No hinting. No, I'm fine. None of that. If we paid attention to letting them know we were either fine or what was up that we needed, right? And we were forward about it and we expressed our happiness. We exclaimed about all the things that make us happy. That like, but authentically, not just, you know, willy nilly, but authentically. That's all they ever wanted. All they ever want is to know that they're winning with you and that they got a happy person that has what she needs. That's it. You have won the game. There's no reason to leave. Why would you leave that? He he, he got it. (laughs) Yeah. And he's won the game too. When that's the case, it's a win-win. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. It's always such a privilege that I get to play with you again. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we're so grateful you were able to join. Bye-bye.